Okay, good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm Alex Simmons. So welcome to this uh, fourth session of uh, today's conference, uh, fourth and final session. And we have three talks that I'll be introducing to you shortly. Uh, and then uh, subsequent to each one of them, provided there's a bit of time, we'll also have um, some questions. And then subsequent, finally, there will be um, a general discussion forum starting around about four o'clock. So first of all, I wanted to introduce you to uh, Chris Draper. Uh, Chris Draper uh, is um, a, a member of the Wild Animal Welfare Committee, a uh, founder member, uh, but he's moved off to uh, take on a role in the US uh, for the Performing Animals Welfare Society, which is a continuation of his career where he's been heavily involved in the welfare of captive animals, uh, captive wild animals in particular, uh, primates, and he brings a great deal of wealth of experience to that particular role. More details about his biography can be seen on uh, the, 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 the website and the, uh, the handouts. Uh, but I'm now going to pass over to uh, Chris's talk, which will last for about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Draper. I'm going to be talking to you today about applying the principles of ethical wildlife control to protect wild, wild animal welfare. My apologies that this isn't a live presentation. Um, so what exactly are the principles of ethical wildlife control? Well, these arose from some work that I was involved in along with about uh, 20 or so other colleagues in about 20, 2015, um, coordinated by some individuals at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And what we were interested in is bringing together um, expertise uh, to form a consensus on um, what were key priorities involved in wildlife control um, to make it more ethically sound and, and protect animal welfare. The meeting uh, involved a two-day workshop and a lot of back and forth between the individuals to come up with a collation of ideas, none of which were um, unique and none of which were, were even new, but the, the, it was the first time they'd been brought together. Um, and essentially, um, it boiled down to seven principles uh, for ethical wildlife control. And um, I'm very much of the opinion that these principles um, are valuable, not just within considerations of wildlife control, but in, in relation to any human interventions in wildlife, be that for management purposes, conservation purposes, etc. So I'll give you a very brief overview of these principles. Um, in no particular order, but uh, one of the, the, the main ones to consider early on in the process would be the need to fully an analyze, consider, and, and possibly modify human practices um, without even attempting to manage or control wild animals. Um, human activity, uh, such as uh, feeding or providing food or providing access, for animals may well be the cause of the issue that you're trying to solve and that rather than having to change animals behavior or remove animals or, or, or uh, other forms of intervention modifying what people are doing um, might be the simplest and most effective solution so for example if you're just a hypothetical example but if you're fi farming fish and, you, and those fish are being predated by seals, um, looking at better protection of the fish farm um, and deterrents, for example, might um, be more effective than, than culling or, or other activities like that. Similarly, if animals are problematic because they've become habituated to people, um, then perhaps changing people's uh, willingness to feed or approach wild animals might be 
the simplest solution rather than expecting animals to, mo be, to modify their behaviour. The second principle uh, for consideration would be the need to justify with evidence um, why you would undertake control or intervention. Um, it's very easy to assume that animals um, need management in, in, many, in many situations, um, but quite frankly in a lot of situations the evidence for the effectiveness of such intervention, interventions may not be there and it's an important part of any uh, assessment process to consider whether or not there is um, a proper justification for intervention or control um, and, and the likelihood of success. And it's also important to remember that there may be a perception that there is a problem, that wild animals are causing problems to, to people or, or other species, but in fact on, on further investigation that may not be proved to be the case. So for example, um, some of the solutions that we might bring to the table in, in terms of wildlife management for conservation, um, they might be, they might sound good, but they may be limited or no evidence of, of their effectiveness. Um, taking animals into captivity for the purposes of conservation um, might seem intuitively like a sensible action, but it, it's fraught with its own suite of problems that may um, limit its, the, the effectiveness of this uh, action in terms of conservation. Similarly, situations where animals are culled um, to control their numbers may of course create um, opportunities for sudden rebounds or large increases in, in number of, of this very same species that uh, is under control, um, thereby perpetuating the problem um, rather than re causing any resolution. It's important to ensure that the objectives of any wildlife control or management or intervention um, are clear and achievable. Um, it's, you know, th this should be articulated at the outset and evaluated throughout the process. Um, for example, is elimination of a population of animals, if that's the desired activity, is that really going to be uh, possible and if it's not possible um, what additional problems does that cause by animals being uh, left behind do, will the problem perpetuate or, or perhaps even get worse it's important to establish waypoints throughout any process to enable evaluation and adaptation um, uh, depending on how things are going and of course to, to establish an end point um, rather than uh, embark on a never-ending cycle of control um, that may be ineffective, it may be expensive, and, and constantly playing resources into something that doesn't work uh, or harms animals is to be avoided. In my opinion, a very important principle within these um, set of principles is the need to prioritise animal welfare. Um, animal welfare is histor has historically been and, and may continue to be um, tagged on as something of an afterthought um, in our interactions with uh, wild animals. And it's important to consider that any intervention can bring quite considerable and in some cases unexpected impacts, negative impacts on animals' welfare. And those impacts may be felt um, directly on animals being um, controlled, being managed, but also on animals that are, that are sort of bystanders in this. Um, so for example, uh, culling or removing um, females with dependent offspring um, might involve a welfare impact not only on the female, but of course then on dependent offspring that are left to starve or be predated. Um, so the, the impacts of, of whatever humans do with wild animals can, can be quite significant and um, methods that 
aim to cause the least harm should of course be favoured. Um, what those are can often be quite hard to distinguish, something that's um, very often uh, avoided of course is, is lethal control of animals um, and, and there, are, there are sound ethical reasons why that might be uh, desired but um, non-lethal uh, interventions as an alternative to lethal control may involve quite considerable animal welfare impact so in try, you know in trying to avoid um, a very negative harm or killing animals one can quite often uh, cause equally or, or in some cases more considerable uh, harms to animals by way of an example um, a lot of efforts to uh, rehabilitate wild animals especially from a very young age um, in, invariably well-meaning may end up with animals being uh, put through quite extensive um, uh, rearing processes or, or, or if in the case of injured wildlife um, veterinary interventions in order to get the animal healthy prior to release only in some depending on the species for the animal to um, no longer be able to survive in the wild and suffer prior to death once released. Any interventions with wildlife need to take into account community values and social acceptability. Um, trying to fly in the face of public opinions and attitudes um, is almost invariably going to come a cropper and uh, proper consideration of um, not only people's feelings and people's opinions but also whether or not there, there's an opportunity to um, influence those um, in order to practice the best possible uh, evidence-based intervention needs to be factored into um, all our cons all our discussions with it in this regard it goes without saying that wildlife management efforts that don't have public support or community buy-in are very likely to fail uh, if not in the short term then, then in the medium to longer term. A couple of examples from Great Britain where there are diverse views on the um, acceptability or otherwise of grey squirrels and, and what what in what interactions interventions should be attempted uh, similarly with ringneck parakeets um, the idea of lethal control is being put forward but uh, certainly divides opinion uh, quite strongly over whether or not that's an acceptable um, uh, action to take our interactions with wildlife need to be reviewed on an ongoing basis um, in a, in a system, systematic manner um, and where possible um, taking into account that they're likely to be iterative process um, with an element of trial and error and learning from previous mistakes and adapting our um, activities based on previous experience. Um, similarly the ability to incorporate new technology, less harmful methodology, uh, less harmful techniques. Um, there needs to be an opportunity for those to be brought in uh, in any of our interactions in, uh, with wildlife in, in a control or management setting. Similarly to the point that was made earlier about um, setting objectives, uh, simply starting a process of, let's say, controlling numbers of a certain animal um, can start you on a, a pathway to um, an endless toll of, of death and, and harm to wildlife um, unless that process is actively reviewed and regularly reviewed and better methods are employed, more effective methods are employed, less harmful methods are employed when available. And a final principle that 
is related to uh, one that we've discussed already, um, where just as it's important to consider evidence when uh, interventions, uh, human interventions with wildlife are undertaken. Similarly, it's, it's very important to look at our uh, attitudes, which again chimes with the community acceptance and public opinion point, but also some of the language that is used around wild animals can significantly influence um, how we treat them. Um, terms such as predator and pest carry such enormous um, linguistic baggage that an animal that is characterised as such or, or as vermin um, may be subjected to far worse treatment and that treatment may be in effect publicly sanctioned just by virtue of being labelled in that manner. Um, uh, I can th I'm sure we can all think of numerous examples of, of rats, rabbits, uh, foxes that all come with a litany of, of very negative um, terminology that to um, uh, to describe them, which, to be honest, has very little biological um, basis, uh, yet allows us not only in practice but even in law sometimes to um, treat these animals well in in a far worse manner than other. Uh, animals that don't have the, the misfortune of coming with these labels. And this, of course, is the same on the, on the other side of things. So, you know, animals that are uh, considered to be threatened um, by virtue of uh, their population status. This isn't so much, so much a, a labelling thing as um, a, uh, a factor of the population of that species, but it can influence how uh, the welfare in particular of uh, the welfare outcomes for individuals of that species plays out. Um, so for example we would condone uh, capture and maintenance in captivity of wild animals of critically endangered species perhaps far more than we would of animals that don't um, meet that conservation status um, even though it's, it's likely to come at some uh, wealth, with what, some welfare compromises and some harms, um, we we would ex view that as acceptable. M many people would view that as acceptable um, because it's with a uh, a greater good um, concept that taking a few individuals into captivity, the last few individuals into captivity in some cases, might be able to save a species. But from the perspective of the individual animals being caught, uh, that may not be something that they're particularly fussed about. So hopefully this very brief overview of the principles of ethical so hopefully wildlife this very brief control overview um, of the principles gives insight of ethical into wildlife. its value, at least as a starting point for discussions relating to how we might interact with wildlife, how we might manage wildlife, um, and how we might perhaps modify uh, human activity moving forward um, through this sort of application of these principles before and during our interface with, with animals. Okay, that seems to have come to a rather abrupt end, but uh, you will have, I'm sure, uh, got the gist of what Chris was, uh, was um, bringing up and uh, this entire paper and the principles it sets out is uh, underlined or at least it's central to everything that the Wild Animal Welfare Committee does. And uh, I think we are very fortunate to have at least two, two of the authors uh, as members of the committee, of which Chris is one. Um, now, I don't believe Chris is online, but uh, perhaps if you've got any questions, I see there's none come up anyway. But if, uh, if there are no questions or if you've got any, then hold them on until we can pick them up um, uh, when we have a, a, a winding up uh, discussion uh, after these next two talks, that is all three are over. In which case, because uh, there's none come up now, uh, I'm going to move on to um, Justine Schotten, um, who will be talking about assessing the welfare of captive wild animals using a particular grid. 
Now, Justine's a, a veterinarian uh, with a long uh, and extensive involvement in um, zoo and exotic animals, and she's currently veterinary services manager at Marwell Zoo. And in addition to that, she's recently been uh, appointed or voted in to be junior vice president of the British Veterinary Association. Uh, so I think we're very lucky to have her uh, come along and, and talk to us today. So uh, I'm going to pass over to Justine now, um, and uh, she'll be speaking for around about 15 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction. I'm delighted to be talking to you this afternoon, and I'm going to speak, be speaking about the assessment of welfare in our captive wild animals using the animal welfare assessment grid. I work at Marwell Zoo, where I lead the vet team, and I'm also the junior vice president of the British Veterinary Association. So why do we care about welfare in zoo species? Well, we have a moral, ethical and legal obligation towards the welfare and care of our animals. It's a real key concern for the majority of zoos and the zoo community. And obviously, we really want our animals to have a fulfilled, happy and healthy life and experience positive welfare states. So welfare underpins our roles in conservation, education and research. These animals tend to be members of populations which are part of international breeding programs that are responsible for keeping ARC populations safe for reintroductions in the future. These animals are advocates for their species, inspiring future generations, improving public opinion of zoos. Um, and when we have animals with good welfare in zoos, the guests will want to visit them, the staff will be happy. We need to show that we're monitoring and improving welfare for our zoo license, for accreditation such as the British and Irish or European associations of zoos and aquaria. And monitoring welfare and looking at animal behaviour can help inform our knowledge around wild animal behaviour, captive animal behaviour and other things like nutrition, physiology, comparative anatomy and how pharmacology affects these species. So how do we monitor and keep standards of welfare high at Marwell? Well, I lead the vet team where we're very lucky to have three vets, including myself and two brilliant nurses. We've got an animal nutritionist and a fantastic animal behaviourist who's also responsible for a lot of the AWAG work we've been doing. So many thanks to her for her help as well with these slides. In the past, we looked at quality of life assessments for our animals, um, particularly when they were becoming geriatric or at the end of their lifespan. Um, and we have also have plans in place, such as our preventative health plans and our geriatric health plans. But over recent years, we've moved more and more towards the animal welfare assessment grid because it's so helpful, it's so flexible, and it really helps us um, to engage keepers in, in the care and, and welfare assessment of our species. At Marwell, we tend to keep species of conservation importance and those that are well suited to a captive life. So why is it important that we set up regular formal welfare assessment? Well, this can be an objective way to provide quantitative data on the welfare states of our animals. We can do it regularly, which will enable us to rapidly highlight the issues and then intervene. And also when we continue to score, we can see how our interventions then improve, hopefully, that animal's life. Or if we fail to improve the welfare, we will know that maybe we're looking more towards a euthanasia decision. And it provides a lifetime assessment rather than a snapshot, because you might be monitoring that animal on a particularly good or bad day, which might not reflect how it's experiencing life sort of overall. But zoos do face a number of challenges when assessing welfare. We need to avoid anthropomorphizing. We want assessments that are non-invasive, otherwise we'll inherently um, decrease welfare when we're trying to measure it. 
staff have limited time so sometimes they are scoring welfare just from snapshots um, which might not be a clear representation of the day but also might not be a clear representation of how that animal really is because it might react to the keepers very differently from someone independent um, because they might associate that person with food for example. It can be very challenging to validate um, because of our small sample sizes so we need to work across zoos and a lot of our species can be quite cryptic or uh, diverse in their taxa. So things like fish and invertebrates can be extremely hard to measure welfare because we fail to understand their, their behavior repertoire as um, diversely as we understand that for mammals, for example. There's a huge number of species and a huge variety across the year in terms of guest numbers and weather, groups and changes in that group etc um, and we have a real deficiency of a lot of data in terms of normal behavior appropriate diet what the social groups are for some of our species I think it's also important to flag that not all natural behaviors will promote positive effective states um, so natural behavior does not necessarily mean good welfare and I think it's also to, important to remember in zoos the role of you stress and sometimes uh, low level occasional stresses can be positive for animals um, psychological health and welfare. And hopefully there'll be further research on this field. So what is the AWAG? This is the Animal Welfare Assessment Grid and it looks at the lifetime experience and assesses it for an individual animal and compares that animal to itself over time. So you can see whether things are getting better for that animal or worse. It's based on the five domains model that we've heard a lot about already today. And we break it down into four grid parameters. So these are physical, psychological, environmental, and procedural. And within those parameters, we choose a number of factors. But it's very flexible because we can choose the factors within those parameters depending on the species, um, the individual, how much data we've got, etc. So you can see these four parameters at the top broken down into factors. We don't want too many factors. We probably have around sort of between maybe four and ten for each parameter. And then they are scored um, based on different criteria. So where one is very good welfare and 10 is very poor welfare. And we can define each of those scores to help the people scoring. So they'll know that a five might be a, a particular description versus a seven might be a, another description. And as I said, we can change the factors and choose them based on the species, the situation, the records available, if we can collect samples, etc. And it's really important to engage the people who will be scoring, i.e. for us, the animal keepers, in this decision making process. So some examples of the factors we've got under physical, we've got body condition, weight and fecal score, which could be a, a chart to help them correlate that. We've got psychological and behavioural, which could include things like social interactions, stereotypic or normal behaviours and reactions to visitors. Under environmental, we might choose um, enclosure complexity or size, nutrition, enrichment, um, whether it has access inside and outside, for example, and how that changes over time. And some of these might be very static, so it might be in the same enclosure every day, um, so that score might stay the same, but other things might change quite considerably. Um, so maybe they're only allowed outside um, during warmer weather, for example, so that would change on a daily basis. And under procedural, we have things like veterinary procedures and changes in routines. And this should give an objective measure of the relative impact of each of these factors on the animal's overall welfare that we can then see graphically. So thanks to Sarah Wolfenson for this slide. Um, she's originally de developed the AWAG for use in primates in lab conditions. And then we've worked with her to develop it further for zoo primates and other species. So you can see the four parameters, the physical, psychological, environmental and procedural. And then the factors are combined to give an overall score for each of those.
And over time, the ABC represent different scores at different time points. You can see how each of those different uh, parameters will change and whether they're improving or getting worse, giving that cumulative effect. So the benefits of the AWAG, it can be used pro predictively, sort of in real time as, as keepers are scoring, or retrospectively based on notes. Um, you can score as frequently or infrequently as you're able to. So some people score daily, others might only have capacity to score sort of once a week. And it's got this huge flexibility and adaptation, both for different taxa, um, whether you're scoring groups or individual animals, um, and specific situations. So we've developed, for example, an AWAG for birds in transport as they're imported and exported across different zoos. And this quantitative assessment gives a cumulative scuff suffering score. We're considering positive and negative effective states, and it's very visual, which can really help engage people with changes over time. So particularly with keepers that have a similar relationship um, to animal owners of, of pets, they have that very close relationship. They might not pick up on subtle changes over time, but if you can show them a graph of today versus a month ago and show them deterioration, for example, it may help you get them on board with a euthanasia based decision, for example. And if you want to, you can weight the scores if you think certain things are more important. So, as I said, it was developed originally for lab primates. We've then published um, and validated it for zoo primates, uh, zoo birds and carnivores and herbivores. There's a PhD project that Sarah's doing uh, with it in dogs. And we've got student project currently with the University of Surrey working on it for decapods and cephalopods. So lots of different species already being looked at. And we've worked with Ruben Digital to develop an app, which is very quick and easy. The keepers can score in real time uh, and put some comments in. So I'll just very briefly show you a few examples of that. So this is our dashboard. You can search for different animals. Um, different studies and assessments over time. Here we've got one animal, we've got dates down here, and then the different parameters, so the physical, psychological, environmental, procedural, and then a cumulative score. And you can see day by day how that goes up or down. And it's color coded, so if the scores were very high, they would become red, uh, which would easily flag your attention to it. This short shows those breakdowns of the parameters over time again. And then a similar graph to what we saw earlier. So you can see how things change and it's great to have these graphs instantly generated from the data you input. This is one of our um, gibbons and you can see on this particular day in September around the 6th, there was some event that caused a, a decrease in his welfare, so an increase in the score. And we can drill down and find out what that was caused by when we look at the data. And this is Pat Patricia, who's one of our water bucks. Uh, and you can see that we've identified exactly why we had welfare compromises at these different points. <clears throat> so uh, on the left, she was initially shut off from the paddock, which caused a spike in, in negative welfare. She was then moved, again, a stressful experience for her and in a paddock where I suppose she didn't really like. She was then moved back to an enclosure which was much better suited for her. So her welfare score dropped, uh, implying better welfare. And then she started getting very lame where her scores very peak very suddenly. And we did make a euthanasia decision quite quickly after the scores went this high. So outcome of using the AWAG, it allows objective feedback on changes affecting the animal's quality of life. You can really drill down into the separate components of welfare. So physical, psychological, environmental and procedural. You can refine it and target specific elements. You can really choose those, those factors under each of the parameters. And if things aren't working for you, you can change them. It's a bit of a learning process and we're adapting it um, quite frequently for our different species as we learn more about them. 
And a massive benefit is it provides this very visual representation of quality of life, which is really easily understood and it helps encourage communication about animal welfare. And it's really helped our team as the vet team, because sometimes we know that the time has come for a particular animal, but we really want to engage our keepers in that decision making process. And this is a great tool to get them on board with it too. We can demonstrate to everyone, our, our keepers, our guests, our, our managers um, and various other organisations that there's this proactive approach taken towards animal welfare. And over time, we can generate big data on welfare, which is particularly important for zoos where we know so little about the welfare of some of our species. So overall, we want to improve and prevent deterioration of the animal's quality of life to give it a good life and a life worth living. Further work, we hope to increase the use of this across taxa. We've got some ongoing student projects I mentioned um, and working with it with our teams in the zoo. We're validating it and hoping to publish on more species. And we'd like to trial it with wild animals. Um, I've adapted an equid one for a wild zebra, for example. We want to see how you can use technology for remote behavioral monitoring and how this can feed into the AWAG as well. There's a few references for you. And I'd like to thank particularly Sarah, Danny and Will um, for all of their help across the board with working on this. Um, thanks also to the Surrey Vet students, Reuben Digital, um, Public Health England and all of the team at Marwell, as well, of course, as the animals. And I would thank you very much for your attention and I'm very happy to much take your attention questions now. And I'm very thank happy you. to take it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Justine. Uh, very, very comprehensive uh, um, setting out of that uh, important grid. And what seems to have happened is we've got quite a few questions come in, um, and we are somehow running a little bit ahead of time. So uh, I think what I'll do is I'll pick a couple of these questions. In fact, there's more coming in as we speak. Um, I'll pick a couple of these ones and put them to you. The one in particular, I, I I thought was um, particularly useful uh, question is how you would validate such a complex assessment tool. You mentioned there were more than one, you've, you've sort of adapted it for different species, but how do you uh, validate it within one species or across species? Thank you very much um, and thank you all for, for listening in and I think the validation is a, a challenge. What we've done in the past is we've um, looked at it across different collections so we worked with WWT when we were looking at validation in birds. Um, we try and use statistical analysis where we can but I appreciate it is it is still based on our own factors and our own um, scoring system within that so there is a degree of um, I guess a difference between scorers. We've validated it with three different scorers in the zoo um, and seeing how we would assess based on historical records um, each of those parameters. And we've actually came up with very consistent scoring just based on daily report sheets. So um, looking back on the daily report sheets, which is just a record of the keepers really giving comments on each of the animals. So I think one way that we've helped to validate it is by looking across scorers to see if they're consistent. And that has been shown to, to work with the breakdown of the one to 10 scores, as I mentioned. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question that's popped up is about uh, monitoring welfare. Uh, the distinction that appears to be being drawn is a, a distinction between uh, the law requiring uh, assessment of welfare for pursue licensing uh, against what appears to be simply a policy by, by IASA. Uh, which which is it? Is it is it more is it a legal requirement or is it merely best practice? So I believe there is a requirement that zoos must, under the zoo licensing, um, you know, look after the welfare of their animals, and that involves just some sort of assessment of that inherently. Um, we've obviously taken it one step further because we want to be very proactive with this. Um, I think Biaza are putting together things like toolkits of various different welfare assessment and, and welfare scoring schemes um, that zoos can go in and use. Um, some zoos 
may assess welfare on a given day in the year, whereas others will be using more a sort of day by day assessment as we're doing, um, which maybe is a little bit more realistic as to how that animal is experiencing things. But so there is a, a duty under the zoo license to assess welfare uh, and to make sure our animals are, are having positive welfare to some extent. Um, and that hopefully will be incorporated more and more into the legal side of things as well. And uh, just a follow up question from me on this one, uh, given that uh, you've if you like, pioneered at, at Marwell and perhaps a few other places, uh, even though there is a, a legal uh, requirement to assess welfare, to what extent do you think this is going to get picked up consistently across all British zoos? Yeah, so we're really hopeful that by the development of this very user friendly app system, it will be something that zoos can sort of subscribe to, input factors that are relevant for their situations, and then use it with their keepers. We've definitely had lots of conversations with other zoos that are keen to, to trial it in their zoos to see how it works for them. Um, so the, the hope is, I mean, I think zoos on the whole are very engaged with this, and they want to be seen to be doing more, and they want to be using tools that really work for them. I think time is uh, always a factor with zoos because they tend, the good zoos often tend to be charities and, and their, their keepers are working really hard around the clock. Many zoos do have dedicated welfare um, roles, which is great and they can spearhead this, but we need to make it as, as quick and easy and practically accessible as possible so that staff in those zoos can go ahead and, and use it and input the data. And the hope is that that app will give zoos that opportunity. Okay, I think we've got time, thank you very much, one, time for one more question, which is uh, within a zoo setting, at which point would you consider that an acute occasional stress that becomes chronic? In other words, if acute but repeated every day, week or month. Thank you. Yeah, so this is something that we've sort of grappled with as we're putting in factors. So sometimes we'll put a time element into the score. So if the animal shows a particular behaviour for more than one day, we'll score it as a, a higher uh, level. And that sort of fits in with the weighting that I described. So you can you can add a time element into your the way that you score things to make up for that obviously we're looking at these scores every day and we're seeing the animal in front of us as well so we can um, bring that experience that we see um, into our decision making as well but we've for some of the scores for example feed intake if it's been more than three days uh, then that will score um, higher so as in more negative welfare than if, if it's just the first day that that's presented okay well, once again, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you very much for that. It's really, really uh, a, a, an excellent way of, of, of approaching what is otherwise a really difficult thing to measure. And it's the holy grail, isn't it? Having uh, consistent, repeatable measures of, of animal welfare, irrespective of the circumstances. So uh, I think this is pushing the, pushing the boundaries. It's really good stuff. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to move on to um, uh, the final talk of today, uh, and this will be from Alistair McGugan um, from Nature Scotland. Um, Alistair's had a long experience of uh, working uh, on wildlife management, uh, but particularly in recent times, uh, working on uh, the impact of, of, of uh, wildlife management and conflict um, management, which uh, is becoming more and more a problem for I think statutory agencies and to a degree uh, conservation NGOs as well. Uh, so I think we're very interested in hearing your in insight because uh, you've uh, got a lot of stuff to do uh, where working in controversial areas but in particular uh, in the context of uh, climate change so the idea about having it uh, brought within the context of uh, net zero carbon is, is, is very helpful. So uh, I'm going to invite uh, Alistair to give his talk now and we will uh, return to plenary or at least with the rest of us in a short period of time. So thank you very much. I appreciate that it's the end of the day and I must say I was rather daunted uh, at the thought of following such eminent speakers. But I thought it would be useful to take a wee step back from the detail we've been discussing today to, to look at the practical context that we find ourselves operating within. 
in many ways, this is a personal reflection on, on where I'd got to in my own journey in better understanding what wildlife welfare means and where it fits within the big issues of the day. Let's just reflect on this single global statistic. A million species, a tenth of the world's total, may become extinct on our watch. And for Scotland, let me paint you a more detailed picture of what we could have if we don't act by 2030. Imagine an apocalypse, polluted waters, drained and eroding peatlands, coastal towns and villages deserted in the wake of rising sea level and coastal erosion, massive areas of forestry afflicted by disease, a dearth of people in rural areas, and no bird song. Frightening, yes. But it also puts things in perspective. Now, having attended a number of international conferences on animal welfare, I sometimes find the discussion around wildlife welfare may become a little self-indulgent, perhaps a little esoteric, and quite often, unfortunately, based more on a belief system which is not that grounded on the practical day-to-day -day decisions that need to be made by the wildlife managers we are all seeking to influence. If we are to keep wildlife welfare relevant, and we must, that is not negotiable. Perhaps we need to become more inclusive, listen rather than preach, become a little bit more pragmatic. My use of perhaps actually there is, is probably wrong. I, I believe we don't have a choice. The climate emergency and biodiversity loss we are experiencing means we all need to change. In Nature Scott, Scotland's Nature Agency, we believe it's not too late to act, and a nature-rich future is our best insurance against the climate emergency. As my comms colleagues keep telling me, out of extreme challenge comes greater exciting opportunities. There is certainly greater attention to our natural world and the wildlife within it. Each week, indeed every day, we're witnessing new global and national commitments for nature and the environment. Here in Scotland, the government has enshrined in law a commitment to be net zero by 2045. In Nature Scott, to help us mitigate and adapt to climate change, we advocate a nature-based solutions. Simply, nature-based solutions refer to the use of nature and natural environments to help tackle socio-environmental challenges and providing benefits to people and nature. Now, the key element there is being benefits to both people and nature. This basic tenet is so simple that in many ways it is actually so complex. But at its basis, I think we often forget we are ourselves nature and part of it, in all respects, red in tooth and claw. So it is within this field of climate emergency that we have to navigate through the sometimes very polarising world of wildlife management. As Jessica has described, welfare is at the centre of Nature Scott's shared approach to wildlife management, and we are striving to ensure that we can give practical advice on applying our wildlife welfare principles. Using nature-based solutions does have its detractors and, and can lead to some really differing beliefs as to what is acceptable. But if we are to be successful in maintaining welfare, central stage, we need to guard against different approaches being demanded for different species just because they're more photogenic. We need to be clear about what is and is not welfare and have the assessment of the animal leading the discussion, not about varying belief systems on whether we like the action or not. To do that latter leads us down a series of rabbit holes and a whole host of conundrums. We keep hearing about the need for transformational change in land use. Undoubtedly, this is what we do need, but surely this means we need to be bringing those involved with the land and wildlife management with us. Are discussions on wildlife welfare ready for that challenge? Are we ready to disentangle the grey areas between welfare and rights, 
Or are we too caught up in the instant hit of social media and PR presence? Are we ready to accept that this means we end up doing things that some people just do not like? I'm going to quickly look at three wildlife, mani uh, wildlife management issues that may help to put some colour on the difficulties we have in making sure welfare remains relevant within a nature-based solutions approach. Stoats. Well, our attitude to stoat control does seem to change depending on the who is doing it and for what purpose. That we have waders in sharp decline, well, that's just not disputed. And therefore, in the Orkneys, £6 million pounds is being invested in the control, actually extermination, of stoats to protect breeding waders, or breeding waders such as snipe and red fallow. When, however, stoke control is undertaken on, say, grouse moors, then the issue becomes more contentious. Yes, grouse are involved, but golden plover, curlew and peewit also gain protection. The welfare issue is the same, i.e. is the trap used of an approved type, meeting kill trap standards, and is it being used in the correct manner? Now, the attitudes to killing deer is interesting in that it bucks the trend, and sorry, apologies for that rather cheap pun. In wildlife management, we usually have to deal with calls to stop lethal control. With deer currently in Scotland, many are calling for an additional 80,000 deer to be killed annually. The need to address overgrazing by all herbivores in Scotland is, is, is well understood, but welfare is often used by advocates for and against uh, lower deer densities. Many in the traditional stocking fraternity are incensed about any proposals to change the close seasons for shooting females, with the welfare of the foetus cited as a reason not to change. Now, dealing with a hind and its well-developed calf when you've shot it is, is not pleasant. Absolutely not. But is it a welfare issue? And how does that compare to roe deer development, where the current season is already six weeks later? Actually, for Nature Scott, the welfare issues we are grappling with is, is more actually about once the calf is born. At what point do we draw the date line to say the calf is no longer dependent? For red deer in particular, we understand the social dependency of female calves within the matrilineal group, that that goes on for years. It is also interesting that there is different perspectives that we have to deal with around who is pulling the trigger. Many are opposed to sport shooting and believe that only trained marksmen should do the deed. Now, it, it costs to manage deer, and that management is predominantly undertaken by the private, and se private sector with private investment. But from a welfare perspective, it is the competency of the individual, not whether they have paid for it, that is the key consideration. Where we've been falling down is the application of welfare considerations to wider management te techniques, more than just shooting. For example, understanding the impact of fences, whether on the open red deer range or within lowland row areas. The impact of providing artificial supplementary feeding. The impact of disturbance on red stags in the winter. And the ever-expanding building development. These areas are more subtle in the welfare consequences and are not on the general public's horizon. They are probably, however, the bigger welfare issue. So, looking at the deer debate in Scotland, you should quickly see that it's not really a disagreement over welfare, but it's a fundamental disagreement over land use and responsibilities. The helpful role that welfare discussions can have is not about whether deer should be killed, but about continuing to develop tools to allow to open up the discussion on how we can better enhance the welfare state of deer. Beavers, well, I'm perhaps entering into a more dangerous ground here, but my own personal experience of how the dialogue around welfare can be rather caustic may be of some use. The experience further emphasised emphasized to me the need to have clarity 
on what is a welfare issue, as opposed to a dislike of a policy position, and that how emotion can be played into it. A policy decision was taken to licence lethal control on certain prime agricultural land to prevent agricultural damage. This actually paved the way to ensure beavers obtained European protected species status, and hence legislation that protected them, which they before that didn't have. In considering how to licence lethal control, we needed to separate discussions on whether licensing tests were met from what the actual welfare considerations were when undertaking lethal control. We carefully consider the best available knowledge on how control was undertaken across Europe and North America, including shot placement, type of firearm or trap that was used, consideration of what the welfare implications were of dam removal at different times, and how, just as we do with deer and other species, the timing of welfare issues of kit dependency. All of that development work was predicated that the decision to licence lethal control had already been taken. We did consider that as the control of beaver was relatively new to Scotland, controllers should be aware of what the practical differences were in shooting beaver compared with, say, roe deer. Thus, I embarked on a series of training events aimed solely at those already experienced in controlling other manual, animals. As such, I included imagery that showed reaction to shot and, and also one of a couple of children holding a beaver caught in an approved kill trap. The presentation was leaked and resulted in personal attacks on me through social media and emails. Now, why do I mention that? Simply to highlight, if we're going to take practitioners with us, we must be absolutely clear about the line between advising on welfare and feeding a cause. It will not advance embedding welfare into daily management techniques to the benefit of us all, if we take different approaches to different species. From these three examples, you will begin to understand that the starting point for Nature Scots Wildlife Management Principles is not whether, but actually how. We are more on the utilitarian range of philosophical approaches, I suppose. And, and that's not surprising, as we promote nature-based solutions for people and nature. The principles that Jessica talked about and our embryonic work in implementing them requires us to be consistent in the approach across wildlife management. As you heard, we are beginning to develop a set of indicators that can be used to first assess whether there is a welfare issue, and then further, whether it is actually a problem, and a problem that can or needs to be addressed. Our approach is about utilising nature to the benefit of all, thus, thus giving it value and, and hence a place. Nature is red in tooth and claw, and we are intrinsic to nature, not separate from it. Our assessment of welfare therefore needs to be based on putting the animal first, not on individual sensibilities. In wildlife management, wildlife welfare has concentrated more on the acute elements, um, such as lethal control and preventing suffering by the individual. Now we need to do more to look at the more chronic management issues that are causing welfare issues. I would suggest that we need to understand how development, building development, road development, impinges on wildlife and limits the animal's ability to respond. Think about agriculture and forestry practices and, and the impact they are having. The trick is not to ban or castigate, but to come up with novel changes to practices that take account of the animal's ability to adapt. For that, we need to better understand the limits of their coping strategies and an easy practical assessment of the welfare, the welfare issues being experienced. I go back to waders as an example. We put work in looking at how different waders use different vegetation heights for what purposes and then supporting a cutting regime that takes account of this. That's the application of welfare in practice. But importantly, it is 
a nature-based solution that benefits both people and nature. From a rather selfish point of view, I want to conclude with a plea. A plea that should help make me and my team's job just that little bit easier as we strive to keep wildlife welfare relevant in a world where the overriding issue is sorting out the climate. That is, look for the common ground. Encourage folks to get closer to wildlife, but not in a sanitised version. Look for ways that wildlife add value and accept that this can include consumptive use. Continue to develop better methods for assessing welfare from the animal standpoint. Give criticism, yes, in a constructive, not a destructive manner. And really question whether the response to an issue is putting the animal first. And, and beyond that, that in putting the animal first, question whether it is really a welfare lens that you are using. As I said at the very beginning, the climate emergency and biodiversity loss we are experiencing means we all need to change. Practical, non-judgmental discourse on how to embed welfare into wildlife management is critical to facilitating that change. Thank you. Alistair, thank you very much. Uh, that was very thoughtful and extremely well prepared, so uh, really helpful uh, discussion, um, uh, presentation. Uh, I have three questions that have popped up uh, whilst you've been uh, talking, um, and I think probably they're all pertinent, and we do have a wee bit of time before we're, we're uh, uh, going to convene on a wider group to have a wider discussion. The first one I'd like to, 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 to put to you, Alistair, um, is what is Nature Scott doing to restore extensive connected natural habitat on a landscape scale that will self-sustain without the need for human intervention? Arguably, this would do more for wild animal welfare than anything else. So I suppose there's two parts to that question, aren't there, really? Um, one is about how do we, how do we get that that connection, how do we get that uh, habitat, to rejuvenate that habitat? I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to use the word rewilding because it has so many different connotations, but certainly we do need to find ways of getting that connections, getting that interactions between the different systems to be working better than they are. But we can't take people out of it. Scotland is a really small country um, and we don't have the luxury of hundreds of thousands of hectares uh, where we don't have any people. So we do need to include people in that. We do need to have people as part of that nature-based solutions. And part of the way that we see that is by getting people to value nature, getting people to value wildlife. I mean, I was taken by um, some of the discussions um, about the economic value of the environment, which was thinking about natural capital, but natural capital wider than just economics, cultural, all those five capitals. And at the centre of that is the fact that we have people and we need to find ways of getting them to understand and to put value on that. So if they don't have value in something, something at the weekend, I was out doing some work, countryside strewn with litter, no value to that nature. And unless we can get that, unless we can change that, then, then we ain't going to get that natural habitat connections. And therefore, we're not going to get the planet countryside being able to heal itself because it will heal itself if we give it its chance. It might not be something that, that we recognize. I mean, it might not be what was back in the 1750s when we look at what was going on in the Grampians, for example. But if we give it the chance, it will do that. But, but we haven't got A, the time, and B, we don't have the luxury of not including humans into uh, that equation, including us as part of nature into that equation. And I think what you've done is, is, is summarise the problem very well because it, it is this uh, conflict and, and, and expectations. Um, the, the other two questions which I've just read are very, very similar to the, to the, uh, the first one was uh, uh, that I put to you, so I'm not going to go through those again. But I think given that we've heard from um, 
Chris Draper, where he's talked about uh, the seven principles for ethical wildlife management. I'm going to use Chairman's privilege here and ask you a question around that particular thing. And the one thing there was about social um, acceptability of the intervention that might take place. And I, mean, I know you've had a long, long career um, uh, associated with, uh, with deer. And I also know that that's becoming a particularly uh, fiery topic in Scotland at the moment. Um, how do you think um, the social acceptability uh, of whatever gets decided can be broadly and wi more widely accepted when attitudes appear to be quite polarised? And how do you think that Scottish sort of nature, Scotland, will will seek to address that? Yeah, so we, we probably are living in um, a period, certainly in, in my professional career, where we have got such conflicting spectrums and and really such, um, I'm going to use the word caustic, and, and I mean that not from one side or the other. I mean, some of the outlying stuff of this is really not good if we're trying to, to look forward and, and bring us together in terms of that. Understanding that we can disagree, I mean, that, that that's, that's the important bit. Um, I think what, what we need to be thinking about is a better connection back to nature, a better connection about what does that mean, a better understanding of the reliance of nature that we have. Um, and, and I know that that sounds too human centric, um, but I think I, 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 I go back to the old keeper that taught me how to go out stalking. And somebody who cares for a wild animal, who had no responsibility, and basically very little legislation at that point, I, I, I've struggled to come across folk who have deep ingrained, I'm going to use the word love, for, for that wildlife that they felt that they were responsible for in, in a moral sense, but were still capable of being able um, to kill it and to use it. But there was a value there. And I think that's what we have to concentrate on is understanding the value that nature and wildlife brings to us and better expose people to, to the range of values that are in there. And therefore the responsibility we have to better understand that and to better question um, the types of activities that we put in place. And, and to understand that if we have a future, that, then we need to be better at understanding how we interact with that and, and pull back in some cases, but be willing to accept that, well, yeah, utilization of nature, if we give it value, is, is, is acceptable. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, again, uh, the, uh, oh, we've got another question that's coming out here. I'm going to put this one to you, and I'm just going to read it out to uh, verbatim. Uh, can wildlife hunting for conservation to control deer and geese reducing wild source food be an acceptable pragmatic solution? And I seem to remember there's been a problem with the uh, uh, killing of geese on uh, Isla, the uh, barnacle geese. That, uh, for, for a long time, those animals couldn't be sold or even, well, I think you could eat them if you shot them yourself, but you couldn't sell them. Uh, so you could argue that actually that was a bit of a problem. Uh, but the idea about perhaps using a word that was perhaps even more loaded than some of the ones we've used already, harvesting deer and geese um, might be uh, a more pragmatic approach, particularly where the numbers are very high. So I wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, no, and, and we heard a lot about language um, through a number of the presentations. And, and I think for, for geese and for deer, what a number of our, 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 the approach that we try to take is, is a very simple change of language from pest to asset. I mean, I, I personally, as a wildlife manager, don't, don't, don't go with pest or vermin, but, but recognise where they've come from. But actually, they're quite a good example of how this language has changed or, 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 or approaches are, are changing and therefore the language is changing. And, and the use of that, um, so the control of, of Orc, the geese in Orkney is the primary example there, where you know, climate change has shifted the distribution of greylag geese uh, further north, or what's called short shopping now. So, in terms of the input, you've, you've almost got, you know, three quarters of a population of the Icelandic geese um, 
concentrating in, in North Caithness and, and in Orkney, causing a whole dose of issues in there. Now, by allowing the sale of geese, by allowing the exploitation of geese in a sustainable fashion, then we're adding value to that species. So it moves away from it being classified as being that pest. And the same, same goes with deer. Part of the fundamental elements of the wildlife management shared approach, of which welfare is whole part of this, it's all, it's all the same game, is that where we can, then we add value. But don't get me wrong, that adding value doesn't always necessarily have to be economic value. There is value by the presence of those species being there. There's presence of having barnacle and isla. There's benefits from the presence of having orc uh, of having um, the grey lag geese in Orkney. Our job is trying to tease some of that out to get that open debate about where that balance should be. Okay, I, I think um, the other questions are more to do with sustainable uh, populations and so forth, which I think are probably not tangential to what we're discussing today. I've got one question I'm going to uh, put to you. We talked a little bit about deer and, 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 and you're clearly very, very experienced of, of, of dealing with deer. And from what I understand, the majority, in fact, not all stalkers have got uh, formal qualifications uh, through the DSC, the deer stalking certificates, either parts one or part two or both. Um, you talked about uh, harvesting or uh, culling uh, excess numbers of, of geese. What's your view about having competence requirements for people involved in that, which are akin to what are being used for uh, deer? Yeah, well, I suppose this is where I have to be careful about um, where the, the policy decision for that one rests. The policy decision for that one rests with the Scottish Government. But, but I think the argument is quite clear um, that we've made all the way through, which is we, we cannot keep treating species differently. We can't have speciation. So we, we need to be really, really clear that, that well, 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 there is an expectation. If you are going to have um, the, the right, if you're going to have the privilege, if you want to use that word, of using that natural resource, then there are certain responsibilities that come with that. And one of those, and a very, very high important one, is unable to be able to demonstrate the skills and competence to be able to deliver that, to utilise that, that resource in a way which meets the highest welfare standards. And, and that's what we're trying to move with. We, we've, we've done it for, we're beginning to do it a little bit more with the deer because, you know, there was that specific element within the deer that, that requires us to do that. But if I'm crystal ball gazing, I think that's the way that we have to be moving um, across all wildlife management. And indeed, maybe across all land management activities, um, because why is it just about wildlife management when we think about what the welfare impacts, um, both positive and negative, are um, across land uses in Scotland. And it's about trying to move, keep moving the debate on um, about how do we really seriously think about and what the, the welfare consequences for our wildlife is by the actions, whether that's shooting, uh, planting, or recreating um, habitat and making networks, new networks. What are the welfare consequences for that on our, well, on, on our wildlife welfare? Thank you very much. I think probably that we we'll probably uh, draw that to a close now. Once again, I'd like to thank you and also um, uh, Justine and, and, and Chris, who obviously can't be with us today, for their contribution today. So thank you very much. We'll now move on to uh, a plenary where the all of the speakers from this afternoon, uh, plus myself and Angus, will uh, and also Pete, I see, she appeared, will uh, have an opportunity to um, table questions and also from uh, other members of the audience today. So uh, we'll just have a quick pause while one or two more people join the uh, throng, I think. Steve has joined. Is Alistair coming back? Yes, yep. he is. Good. All right. Pete, would you like to take over now or would you want me to carry on? Uh, 
Well, I can do, but you, you can uh, chip in, of course, and, and Liz and uh, Angus might join us as well. <coughs> well, thanks, thanks everyone. We've had a really fascinating afternoon, lots of different aspects, and we've had um, a number of, well, quite a lot of questions. We haven't been able to pick up on them all, but I would just say to the delegates who are feeding those in, we, we won't lose these questions, and, we're, and certainly the walk will have a you know, good consideration of these uh, over, over the next period of time. There was one sort of common theme that came out to me, and it's not so much an animal welfare question as such, but relates to how we engage a wide range of uh, communities who aren't necessarily traditional stakeholders in some of these important decisions about animal welfare. Uh, Justine, when you were talking about the animal welfare assessment grid, you you are you wondered about you know empowering a wide range of stakeholders, and as we just heard from Alastair, you know there are there are lots of people who have an interest in the practices in the countryside that impact on wildlife welfare that don't, if you like, traditionally have a, a seat at, at the table, uh, and that's a sort of uh, an area that um, uh, that that. that came out from a nut, well perhaps most of the talks actually we've heard today, so I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts about that and actually how we enfranchise, if you like, a lot of people that might feel a bit aside to some of the discussions we've been having. Perhaps that was a question I shouldn't have posed. I mean, uh, just let us kick off. Yeah, thanks. I can maybe just comment from the zoo side. So I think it is really important for zoos to um, engage with the public and educate the public around what we're doing, that we even care about the, the welfare of our animals, because I think a lot of it does go on behind the scenes and uh, zoos need to get better about communicating that to the public so that they know, you know, we're taking this really seriously. We're doing these assessments uh, and reacting to them. Um, I think the wider question is a, a much more challenging one, uh, I guess, just as a comment from my British Veterinary Association perspective, you know, we do, when we engage uh, about policies around animal welfare, we're looking at um, non-traditional companion animal welfare, um, so some of these wild species that may be kept in captivity, but also um, animal welfare in the wild to some extent, you know, we do try and engage with as many different stakeholders and, and think about people um, across the board who might have a comment on this um, to get their opinions too, and then take that forward in our lobbying work. So, um, but I, I think it's a huge challenge and I think it's really important that we work on that. Cathy. Thanks, yeah, no, I think, um, I think it's a really interesting question actually, and I think it sort of reflected what some of the discussion this morning as well around, you know, I think Heather's point about, um, you know, spending time in nature being positive for your views of animals in general. So I think it is something really important as a child that we, we think about maybe childhood education in nature. And I think one of the difficulties with wildlife is often this issue that probably sort of Alice talked about as well is, is a resp who's responsible for it. And often you feel as, I think a lot of people feel that they're not really responsible for the welfare of wildlife so therefore they're not engaged so much in the conversation as they might be if you're talking about responsible pet ownership or those sorts of things if you if you're a pet owner so i think it is drawing people it's finding a way i suppose of engaging everybody because everybody is involved in this and if you want to have the sort of nature-based solutions we need the engagement of everybody really not just those people who live in the countryside or work in the countryside or, or perhaps feel more directly related to the welfare of of, of wildlife or, or the management of wildlife at least that actually it's something that we need to find a way of drawing in school children but everybody I suppose to see that they have a relationship and, and that can be really difficult I think you know one of the things in our Delphi study came out was the sort of thinking around um, people going to the wild and I think this has been an issue with, with, with the lockdowns as well that people spending more time in the countryside allowing their dogs off the lead and then the consequences of that for for wildlife so it's finding that right balance between encouraging people to engage in thinking about the question but also making them aware that they have responsibilities that you know it's it's that, that, that you are engaged but engaged in a responsible way which is no solution I realize to your question but it's just um thinking that this is a uh, it is really challenging but I think it is something we have to kind of grapple with if we want to 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 bring that responsibility and that caring and thinking about 
wildlife welfare to, to everybody. Well, I, I mean, Jessica, you mentioned sort of one of the underpinning principles for the uh, Scottish, Scottish nature approach, oh, sorry, nature Scott approach was that we picked up on the uh, society's belief of what an animal experiences. I suppose there's a sort of underpinning educational need there to make that a relevant question, but I, and I agree that it's important. It's just how one captures that, I think, is quite difficult, perhaps. Yeah, no, I agree. It is, it is really difficult, and there's probably not just one way of doing it either. And Catherine just mentioned the the opportunity really it's presented itself through the lockdown and people getting more involved. So perhaps people before might have let a dog off the lead and not really thought about it, whereas now they might be aware that it's a pee witness or an, or whatever. So you know that presents an opportunity. But it it's it's schools and it's it's social media. It's, it's a little bit of everything. But I suppose it's maybe being mindful of it. And, and all the time, so if there's an opportunity that presents itself to, to work on that, you know, to all, so everybody takes responsibility for um, raising awareness, educating, involving people when they can, and, and a slightly piecemeal approach, but that would probably be quite effective. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, there are other general uh, points came out of some of the earlier talks, and, and, and Steve, Stephen touched on this too, and that was that the that the environments that wild animals are in are, are also changing all the time, and that could be through a natural process or it could be through some sort of man-made process. And I think as in, is captured in the nature Scott approach, it's the adaptive nature of the animal's own ability to respond to those situations which are important. But I guess there's a limit to how much animals can adapt in the in the rapidly changing time frame that these things happen. I, how, how does anyone feel about the fact that what might represent good animal welfare today might be different tomorrow? Too, too challenging a question for late in the afternoon, perhaps. <laughs> Alex. Well, I, I, it just, I, I noticed there's a number of quite interesting questions popping up on the, the question list, so perhaps we should come to those after we dealt with this one. Right. Well, if you'd like to keep an eye on those, please, that would be really handy. And uh, I, obviously, this is this is too much of a challenge, but this uh, concept of uh, allostasis, I guess, an animal's adaptive ability, is something that's perhaps relatively new in animal welfare assessment but it's certainly important that uh, as as you showed us Jessica that we, we're on a sort of continuum and the animal's ability to respond to a situation is important so if, if the animal's presented with a, a difficult situation which is a challenge to its welfare but is able to respond to that arguably that there, there is no particular welfare issue it's when it can't respond that we have a particular concern I guess and and that seems to be the basis for the work that Frauke uh, did some years ago I guess. Uh, Alistair. Sorry, my mouse stuck there on this one. I needed it to work. Yeah, I, and, and that's why it's all, so it, it is part of what the Frog and yourself, you were involved with that piece as well. It is, is, is that bit about that constant change and why that idea about the stretching of, of that welfare spectrum? Because actually, you probably need that stress element to be able to, to tease out just where um, the animals are able to respond, expand, uh, respond to that pressure or not. Um, but that's also why I was interested in, in Justine's approach for, for the zoo animals. And I, I think there's something in there about a crossover for that, because what really struck me was the ability to take that graph that you show, I think it was the second one, and make that relevant to, to the keepers. So you could see what was going on there. And I think that's something that we can we can learn from, from each other in terms of that. how do we do that? How do we how do we extend that out into wildlife welfare? And so that we can actually begin to see, so we're, we're, we're taking Jessica's uh, figure of that, you know, that green to red and being able to see, well, how much of that is shifting into the red and how much of that is shifting into green and being able to respond to that. But, but it also for me um, means 
we need to have a landscape which is a little bit more robust than it currently is so that the wildlife that we have have got the opportunity to utilize and therefore use some of the innate um, characteristics that they may have but have not yet been fully utilized so that's why i think there's a big connection there between landscape management habitat management and, and animal welfare but but that tool that justin you're, you're developing there and using i see that as a really good way of, of us being able to better visualize i mean I, i'm some of the thinks and pictures rather than words but i think that that approach really really helps I think that's good and I think I, I, you know I, I'm conscious of the fact that perhaps some of the animal welfare concerns are are somewhat wet retrospective when a decision has been made and I wonder wonder Stephen whether we can use your your impact assessment approach in a sort of proactive way in terms of thinking about some pre-planned management change and we can actually make some a uh, hopeful prediction about what might the impact be on the animals concerned. Do you think there's a scope for using the impact assessment in that way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the um, the animal welfare impact assessment is is intended to be used um, prospectively, uh, and you know, it it's intended to be used um, for governments or public bodies, um, but you know, it could be used by um, general managers or public or organizations or whoever and obviously there's some you know what I noted today there's some similarities between various approaches you know looking at welfare there seems to be a consensus which is a fairly long-standing consensus looking at in terms of uh, duration and intensity or severity maybe if we're just focusing on negative impacts um, but you know from my point of view just going back to what you were talking about earlier I just think it's important um, you know but based on my research, looking at the, the Westminster government, you know, there really is a lacuna. There's a lack of a process where the government is, you know, doing a should be doing a fairly simple thing, which is just looking at the, the, the welfare impacts. And, you know, at best, it is very, very patchy. And what I was pointing out there is, you know, uh, certainly as a member of the European Union, there was an obligation that I would argue is, you know, wasn't properly being met. And that was therefore applicable, you know, probably to many countries in the European Union, given that, that the UK is generally considered um, as one of the uh, better countries. Um, and just to follow on from what Mike Radford said earlier, you know, the, the, the market has a huge role, education has a huge role, you know, individuals have a huge role, but, you know, the government has immense resources at its disposal and also has that guardianship responsibility um, and so, you know, in my view, the broader sort of animal protection community should be lobbying their own governments for a mandatory animal welfare impact assessment. And until the government are doing that, you know, we should be doing that as much as we can with the resources that we have ourselves. Good point. Thank you. Alec, I'm going to hand over to you for a second because you've been noting things down from the delegates coming in. There, and I, I don't want to, to, I would like to give everybody a fair crack of the whip, but but there's two questions that I think are really quite uh, pertinent. Um, one of them I think is really quite well crafted, and it's uh, it question is with farm animals we can sell better welfare through uh, healthier animals, increased production, and niche products. For live animals we can sell inverted commas better welfare because we get better science. How can we sell wild animal welfare, and to whom are we selling it? There's a few smiles, but nobody's no, nobody's volunteered to answer it. But I think it's a good question. Right, Kathy, you were the first up to the starting blocks. Yeah, no, I know I don't like a silence, so I'm obviously very well trained to jump in when nobody else puts their hand up, even if I've got nothing to say. Um, I was, I suppose, I was slightly wondering whether you know we, we don't really leave farm animal welfare to market forces do we because it doesn't work we've we've shown that many many times otherwise all farm animals would have better welfare than they do so it does rely on a relatively small number of people who are prepared to pay more for better welfare and i suspect the same is also potentially true for wildlife that there will be a number of people for whom they, they value nature they value wildlife they value those environments and wildlife tourism or other things can sell that concept to them 
but it won't necessarily chime with everybody because we see that across the piece with any kind of welfare issue that there are lots of people for whom they don't really care unfortunately you know when, when we've had some of these exposés on the, the tv about um I think of the chicken dinner thing that um, there, were, there were a whole bunch of people who pivoted to buying higher welfare products but there was an equal number of people who thought wow you can buy a chicken for a pound in tesco's and went and shopped there so it doesn't it doesn't you know capitalism doesn't work or market forces doesn't solve the problem for everybody and i think um i, I suspect we are going to be selling to a niche group of people who want to go into nature and see these things or, or perhaps we can do it through education as well but um yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that market voice has always worked, unfortunately. We probably ought to give all the panel a chance to listen, to chip into that. But Alistair, did I see you raise your hand almost at the start? Yeah, no, I meant then I'd like that programme to have no silence. Um, I think it's a common theme, uh, not just within welfare, but it's a common theme for us. Uh, uh, how do we make carbon zero, net zero, um, available, understandable? How do we make conservation? How do we make sustainable use? How do we make biodiversity loss relevant to, to people? And that's where this concept of the value comes in. And, and Cathy, you're right. I think what we possibly concentrated on too much is, is that economic value and the market forces side to life. But I think what, what we're beginning to see is, is an understanding about what value actually means and, and the widening out of value. And that, that different stakeholders put different values and, and have different priorities in the types of values that they put in. And, and that's basically what is at the base of, of our nature-based solutions, which is understanding that. But I think the other thing that I'm quite um, more optimistic about is, is, and it's going to come sweet for me, but the younger generation. I do think there is an awareness now more than certainly my generation um, about what is going on um, on, on that wider um, you know, climate change agenda. And I think the trick for welfare, wildlife welfare, is to understand where we can make those connections with that. So why do we need a robust set of habitats? Why do we need a robust set of, of wildlife? Well, because actually you need it to survive. The planet needs it to survive. And I think that type of dialogue has got more... Um, has got more oomph to it than it has for a long, long time. Any other contributors to this tricky conundrum? In a way, it's a balance between public goods and private goods, in a way, because some of these things affect us all. Sandra? Sorry, can you turn your microphone on, Sandra, please? Thank you. Was that it? Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow on from Cathy by saying um, there are ways that we can bring the public into choices about um, wildlife management as well as, as other ways that they think about wildlife. Um, and I've been for some years banging on about the p possibility of having a, a voluntary trap approval scheme for the traps that are currently unregulated in the UK for the breakback traps for rats and mice and the mole traps. Um, Currently, there's no information on the welfare impacts of those traps because there is no obligation for them to be tested through an approval process. Um, however, if information was available to people about the welfare impacts of different models of trap, for example, I think there's a big contingent out there in the public who would be inclined to buy the better welfare traps as, as they are inclined to buy free range eggs and free range chicken and things like that. Um, so I, I just thought I'd mention that, that, that there is enormous scope, I think, to bring the public into choices about uh, pest control. And it, it's not necessarily um, about the kind of methods that they might use at home, but it's also about um, in get, uh, encouraging uh, pest controllers and in inverted commas uh, who come to provide them with services uh, only to use methods that the, the, the customer approves of. Thank you. Uh, Justine, I was going to sort of extend this to the the zoo environment. Uh, there's obviously constant endeavour to provide enhanced enclosures for animals. Do you, is there any sort of tangible way, do you think, to gauge public uh, approval of those, not just because the animals look more natural, but because their welfare might be better? Do you get a feel for that? Yeah, I think so to some extent. I mean, we always try and upgrade and improve our enclosures partly to make them 
give give the public a more naturalistic and immersive in experience so a little bit more like going on safari rather than going to a zoo to see an animal in a cage we always give our animals the option of being off show so inside or in a part of the outdoor exhibit that the public can't see so i think we encourage people to you know go and search for the animals and have little peek holes and things like that but not be disappointed if they don't see them and have those conservation messages and promote the fact that we're giving this animal choice um it it may or may not want to be right in front of you um, we're also working with things like animal training and how we best present that to the public so we train our animals particularly for veterinary related interventions so that we improve their welfare um, but we want to be very mindful that we don't present that in a way that is sort of a show or animals doing tricks and that sort of thing so really getting the messaging across appropriately um, but I, I would completely agree with, with what the other speakers um, have pre previously said about how we value nature and we're really keen to engage the younger generations um, through school visits and and showing them these more naturalistic environments rather than just an amazing charismatic animal in a cage um, and just one more point if I may uh, just wanted to mention as well um, around social prescribing so I think with more and more social prescribing which is how you know a lot of the medical professions are, are encouraging us to engage with nature to improve our mental health um, I think will help society to value nature and wild animals more uh, um, as this grows so that's a, an area that I think will really help our cause as well yeah good point thank you Alec I'll come back to you for any for what you've been well, picking up on the chat there is a, a particularly good question from Libby, uh, who, uh, as you know, is uh, the person who keeps walk running. Um, it is uh, how do we translate the knowledge and expertise demonstrated throughout today into government policy? Stephen has made practical recommendations, e.g., independent commission, animal welfare impact assessments, etc. But how do we explain all this to legislators and get a good hearing? Stephen, do you want to pick that up given your uh, work in that area? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I, I mean, the the bodies, first of all, um, as as Libby will know, are campaigning for Scotland has has an animal protection commission, and and I think it's um, very well um, constituted, actually. Um, I've written an article before about, um, you know, the, the Animal Welfare Council um, and the lack of representation um, of uh, animal welfare NGO individuals um, before, which I find quite sort of surprising. There's good representation in the Scottish Animal Welfare um, Commission. Um, you know, I think that there is an increasing recognition for the importance of prospective animal welfare impact assessments. Um, I think it's a very logical um, thing once you look at it and notice the lack of it. Um, I think really we just need to be um, all lobbying with one voice. I think actually um, as many panellists here will know and possibly a number of um, viewers, actually in the UK, um, quite coincidentally um, with Brexit, I think Lush funded um, the animal, uh, the, the animal, the the, the Association of Lawyers for Animal Welfare um, to coordinate the groups um, to write a report on the um, the impacts of Brexit. And actually, you know, in my view, that's led to a much bigger development with a lot more organisation between the different groups throughout the UK. And, you know, an organised body is always going to be a much more powerful, um, you know, in terms of a single voice. So I think good things are happening in the UK. And again, I'd encourage, you know, other um, countries around the world to kind of emulate that. Um, so strong unified unified voice calling for the same thing, you know, with, with strong arguments. Thanks, Steve. Any other thoughts from the panel? I think it's a tricky one to, to have a, there, there are lots of uh, groups trying to bend the ear of politicians yeah steve carry on yeah just to tie this in with a former question as well about about selling um animal welfare or wild animal welfare my view is that the public are actually very um you know positive about wild animal welfare like alistair said there's a new generation you know 
um, the idea of uh, the, the climate crisis and so on and so forth. I think there's a real public consciousness, to use Mark Jones's term um, from earlier, um, probably something I want to look into more with my own research. But the research that I've done, it seemed to me that Parliament, the public and Parliament, again, this is Westminster, seem to be far more progressive about animal welfare compared to the executive government. And, you know, this this I don't think is is just for the current governments, for previous Labour governments as well. And, and you know, I think there's actually a real democratic um, deficit, essentially, uh, in this country. I think we've recognised that um, since Brexit, first past the post system and the whipping of MPs and so on um, is, is an issue. Um, but um, so I think the, the question before was a very good one about how to sell it and this issue as well. But the the positive here is that I think the public are actually very, you know, positive about animal welfare, as are the parliament. You know, if you speak to MPs, they'll often tell you that their biggest post bag, the, the, the most letters they get is about animal welfare. You know, so there's, there's a real high public consciousness. But for some reason, that's just not being translated into policy. You know, there's some real barrier there, which I think is to do with the government and 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 probably industry um, lobbying government. Um, so you know, it's not a solution, but I think that would be some that you know locating part of the problem, as it were. Yeah, thank you, Alec. Um, well, at the risk of probably uh, uh, <laughs> infuriating a couple of people, I, 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 you know, I should probably know I used to work in central government. Uh, there was an awful lot of effort put into animal welfare work. Uh, my personal view was that it was often directed at the things where uh, it was going to try and alleviate public concern. So there was a great deal of stuff about zoo animals in circuses, or so, uh, wild animals in circuses, dog microchipping, and uh, ooh, a couple of oh, dog breeding, all of which are, if like, things that probably we ought to address, but really uh, my concern is, is to do with the greatest good for the greatest number. So that's why I think we should be looking at things like uh, rat poisoning, broader chickens, which I appreciate is not what we're here to do, um, and uh, probably pigs, um, because that is where the, the, the vast majority of, 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 of chronic um, and unresolved problems lie. Um, so, but you know government takes animal welfare seriously but it does concentrate on those bits where the uh mail bags get bigger and bigger so when you've got campaigns about for example wild animals and circuses then everything just gets diverted over to that and uh anything you might want to do about um farm animals or in this case wild animals just gets put to one side very frustrating I think also there might have been a, in, in the general wild animal welfare era, there may have been a bit of sort of historical complacency, if you like, because people might have said, well, why wouldn't you be concerned that the welfare of wild animals is good? And on that basis, you might not have wanted to do anything. Yeah. But I think I'm going back to some of these questions we had earlier as well. It's often difficult to reconcile small impacts on a very large number of animals versus a big impact on a, a small number of animals and as you've suggested Alec you know that that's even in a farm animal setting part of the driver of action okay so let's uh, we've got a few minutes left Alec uh, and sorry did I miss a hand up no okay well, Alec any another question um uh, yeah yeah let's see it, this is this is a a little bit more difficult one to answer, which is why I picked it. Um, are any panellists who hold concerns for welfare but hold a rights-based or non-dominion-based ethical view regarding our relations to other animals? I suppose you could all just say yes. <laughs> Perhaps not. Do you want me to read out again? Please. Are there any panellists who hold concerns for welfare, which I'm sure that's everybody, but hold a rights-based or non-dominion-based ethical review regarding our relations to other animals. And I'm assuming when they talk about other animals, it means animals other than wildlife. So, 
Stephen. Well, I I just say um, I, I I wrote an article some time ago now about um, it's it's actually it's it's possible you know a, a right is basically um, a, a valid claim to protect the fundamental interest. Okay, and so it's it's absolutely um, logical to speak of an animal having a right to animal welfare. You know, and and we could have that in law. We could uh, the government could say animals have a right to animal welfare. I, I think it's a real shame, actually, the kind of the you know the the rights and welfare um, dualism divide because um, it creates a lot of sort of unnecessary um, antagonism. Um, and I think probably actually a barrier to progress. Um, so, you know, the animal welfareism, which is broadly that we can use animals in society, we can harm them, you know, that's morally justified. That is different to the abolitionist, um, the abolitionist view. Uh, but this, this is why the, the welfare rights dichotomy is problematic, because people then think that animals can't have rights because it will necessarily lead to abolitionism which they may not agree with, um, but at the same time, or society may not agree with, you know, that's too extreme. Um, but the problem just with a welfare approach is that, you know, the animals are never fully protected because they don't have a right. We just have a duty to respect their welfare. And so actually, you know, again, it will be good to move on to, you know, talk about the possibility of having a right to animal welfare. And, pe you know, people like, Garner, Rob Garner in the UK has sort of talked about this, you know, a kind of a, a watered down animal rights view, if you like, in, in his different language, um, but sort of not really worrying too much about killing. So we could say that, you know, farm animals, it's easier in this case, farm animals should have, you know, a right to good welfare and they'd be more likely, more strongly protected in that way. Yeah, I think the difficulty is knowing knowing which route is likely to make the biggest uh, advance in in the animal welfare. To be honest, because in a way both have a have an option for that as the outcome, but actually there may be some alienation in one approach compared to the other, which which could be could jeopardise genuine progress. I think, Cathy. I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to actually properly answer this question. I was thinking it actually relates to the previous discussion about, um, about governments and how they make decisions about what pieces of legislation to follow up on. And I think um, it depends a little bit on which, which ethical view you, you hold most dear. And I think many of us are, are perhaps not very good ethicists because we tend to have a bit of a blended version of we might be utilitarian in some contexts, but we might be more uh, deontological in other contexts or, or whatever or maybe even have some rights views that say some things are just not acceptable to me but these other things are um, but I, I think when you when you when you think about these difficult ethical approaches that might have a very big impact on the sort of pressure that governments may experience and how they might respond to them because they may have very difficult ethical views to or the lobbyists might have different ethical views to perhaps welfare scientists or who as you, I think, as, as Steve and, and Peter both said, by and large, are looking at how can we improve things from the status quo? How can we make things better in an incremental way rather than a sort of revolution to, to stop farming animals, say? <clears throat> and I think, I suppose, I, I think Steve makes a really good point that it's not it's not good to have this sort of confrontation because I think we are all concerned about the lives of animals, but we might be approaching it in difficult way, in different ways. And I think. Um, how do we improve welfare is i suppose we, we i suppose as a someone who's a welfare scientist you think about what can i do to make the lives of animals better today perhaps rather than focus on a longer term view that might say we don't do any of these things anymore because it's hard to see how that will impact on the lives of animals now but you may i can see how a rightsist view would think that is colluding with farming or laboratory animals or any of the other uses of animals that may be seen as, as confrontational Thanks, Cathy. Alec, have you got one more challenging question for us before we say thank no, you to the panel? No, I don't think I have. The majority of them have, have, have been covered, even though maybe I haven't put all the questions to you, because they've been, and the rest of them are more comments, um, either thanks or saying it's a good start and a variety of other things. Uh, so I think there's probably not uh, another 
substantive question that we need to address. Okay. Well, I think on that very positive note, uh, <laughs> we should say thank you to the speakers and the panel for this afternoon's session because that's uh, opened our eyes to lots of new areas. Uh, so thank you all very much and thank you for the effort you've put into making those uh, super presentations. And to everybody who's been listening in, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry if we haven't answered all of your questions, but um, as I said at the start, we won't ignore those. We're going to pick those up at the um, Wild Animal Welfare Committee meetings from, from now on. So, so thank you for your uh, joining us today. But just a couple of thank yous before we uh, sign off. Uh, I'd like to thank um, particularly Steve Wickens at U4 uh, for the uh, technical wizardry that's kept us going today. Thank you very much, Stephen, and that's that's been very good. We haven't necessarily all used the GoTo webinar platform before, but that, that's worked very smoothly thanks to your skill. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you to the speakers from this morning and this afternoon for such a wonderful wide range of uh, relevant topics to our three questions um, at, at the start of the day. Uh, and yeah, it was difficult, I know, to squeeze so much into your short allotted talk time, but I think it's been a real eye opener for everyone. And uh, to uh, the audience at large, you can look at these talks again. Uh, some have already been loaded up onto the uh, link to the Walk website. So they're there for you to have a look at again and digest. And um, you know that who the speakers are, there, there are details of where they're uh, allegiances are and you can you can uh, look at their home institutions to look at their publications for example if you wanted to. Uh, thank you to my walk colleagues who are chairs for helping to keep to time. Someone who's been in the uh, background is Libby Anderson um, and she's been busy uh, tweeting today so there's there's, well, there's lots of uh, interest out there in, in the big wide world to everything we've been doing today. Um, but uh, just finally, to uh, thank all the delegates for, for joining us today and um, from all around the world. Uh, we know it's been challenging from the time perspective for some of you, but thank you for joining us and showing your interest in uh, wild animal welfare and the interactions we have with uh, uh, wild animals in the small planet we, we share with them. So thank you very much for that. And if you want to find out more about the Wild Animal Welfare Committee, please please go to our website and you can post any questions to us there as well. So with that, I'll thank you all very much for joining our virtual conference today. It's been a new development for us, but it's allowed a lot more people to join in. Uh, and we hope you've uh, enjoyed it, uh, learned things and perhaps made some new connections as well. So with that, I'll sign off and thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.